Hello and welcome to the Inside Social Work podcast, a podcast that aims to inspire, engage and connect social workers with other social workers and allied health professionals doing interesting and amazing things across the world. I'm your host, Marie Vakakis. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy today's podcast episode. podcast. Uh, Today's episode I chat with Dr. Yvette Vardy and uh, Yvette's a clinical psychologist with a special interest in working with borderline personality disorder, uh, complex presentations and also a technique or a modality called DBT and her energy and enthusiasm for her work is so contagious we were chatting right up until the very last minute Um, and it's really beautiful to hear someone talk about um, trying to reduce the stigma surrounding conditions like borderline personality disorder. Uh, Yvette shares a little bit about her personal journey and the experiences she had supporting a dear friend of hers which led to her uh, specializing or choosing to focus on uh, working with um, BPD in particular And she talks a little bit around some of the stigma surrounding BPD. And then one of the techniques that works really well for supporting those individuals who live with um, borderline personality disorder called uh, DBT. And she talks a little bit around how DBT is used and some of the other uh, conditions that DBT can be helpful for. Here is my interview with Yvette Vardy. Hello and welcome back to the Inside Social Work podcast. Uh, today I'm talking with Dr. Yvette Vardy. Welcome, Yvette. Hi. Thanks. <laughs> um, so you're uh, a psychologist. Could you tell the listeners a little bit about who you are and the kinds of things that you're doing and working on? Yeah, I'd love to. Um... So I, yeah, I'm a clinical psychologist. I've been working now for, oh, it's coming up to 20 years. <laughs> Feels like, um, yeah, that seems um, surprising to say that. Uh, and I guess my work has focused on treating people with complex presentations uh, and personality disorders. And I suppose the thing that got me started in my focus on personality disorders and borderline personality disorder specifically is that I was spending time with a friend during my undergrad psychology years and there was a time where this particular friend of mine became more and more unwell and she started to express suicidal ideation and she started to um, really uh, become and teary and more and more distressed she engaged in some self-harm and she shaved her head and um, seemed like she was also hearing some voices and things. And I I didn't know really what I was seeing, but I was really worried about her. And um, I took her into hospital one time where she just felt like she couldn't guarantee her safety. And Um, I sat with her as we waited in emergency and and she asked me to come in with her as well during the assessment. And, yeah, the the whole process, I suppose, was interesting for me and she ended up being admitted into hospital. When I visited her there in that admission, um, I was shocked by how she was really heavily sedated and how she'd been treated. She'd been put in isolation. Um, 
she the sort of attitude of the staff around her was clearly stigmatizing and I I guess I really couldn't believe that clinicians and the healthcare system still really clearly had such negative and hostile attitudes like people in the system and I found out uh, when she was discharged from that hospital that she had been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and I to be honest I hadn't even heard of it at the time and so I started to I started to look it up and I was thinking what on earth is this and um, and I discovered uh, just the immense stigma attached to the disorder and I read some awful things in textbooks and on you know in various places about about even the treatment like even about um warning clinicians of um, people with personality disorders being untreatable and just really alarming things so I guess um, I guess it was horror uh, that this existed still uh, that motivated me to be a positive influence in the field and to treat people with care and ethics and, um, yeah, hopefully help people become well. That's such an incredible journey and what an experience for you to witness as a mental health professional um something so impactful to someone you love and care about yeah yeah it um it was incredibly impactful and I'm so relieved that attitudes are changing and I think it's still this the level of stigma and the ideas about personality disorders um, and the, I mean, it, there's a lot of negative communication that exists still online and um, in clinicians who've done training a while ago, but I'm relieved that things, yeah, things have definitely improved a lot since I started. And um, dialectical behaviour therapy, which was out at the time this happened but it was only newly sort of out I suppose it hadn't been um I guess not many clinicians practiced it at that point it um it was a great thing that I discovered and the more I learned about dialectical behavior therapy the more I personally sort of tried it out to get to know it the more I just loved it. And uh, so I guess I became passionate about that too. And, um, yeah, I am still practising dialectical behaviour therapy and still just as passionate and still loving it. So, yeah, I'm pretty lucky. Yeah, yeah. That's really great when you have um, an area of interest and you start to piece things together that really energise you as a professional right yeah and I'm lucky that I threw out my I guess because I had this experience in my undergraduate psychology that I could then use my master's and all the placements and stuff to deliberately target uh, training in personality disorders so I could get some exposure into schema therapy and dialectical behaviour therapy and psychodynamic therapy and um, really flesh out different approaches and use the training to have more experience working with complex presentations to, yeah, I suppose, gain confidence in, in that work. So. I was really lucky that I went to a university that allowed me to um, 
cater my placements to the particular passions that I had. So, yeah, I had a really great experience there. That's that's great. And I want to, I guess, talk about both borderline personality disorder since you mentioned the stigma surrounding it and then also a little bit about um, DBT as a uh, modality. What are some of the things that you heard um, or you've, you've kind of seen that people have misunderstandings about surrounding um, BPD? Like what are some of the common things that people get completely wrong? Yeah, so there are a few key things that continually, they still present today uh, quite often. And I suppose one um one of those is the idea that people with borderline personality disorder are manipulative. And I think Marsha Linehan, who created dialectical behaviour therapy, put it really well in the idea that if, if it's true that people with BPD are manipulative, then they are not very skillful in that attempt because skillful manipulators uh, have intention of what they're trying to achieve from the other person and they succeed by having that person go along with and perhaps be oblivious to being manipulated. So if someone is left feeling uh, cajoled or um, pressured in a particular way, then it hasn't been interpersonally effective. And uh, so we, we, you know, we don't, it's interesting the level of fear or um, anger about being manipulated and it's a little bit there I guess, a blurring of boundaries that um, we as clinicians or, you know, family members or friends struggle to say no or struggle to just maintain the boundaries that we're comfortable with. So, and I think that's the other myth rather than, um, so aside from, the idea that people are manipulative. Um, Again, and I've never never come across someone with that deliberate intention to, um, yeah, so it's just a a very hostile, judgmental word. But I think there's the idea that people with borderline personality disorder really push boundaries and take from you when, you know, when in ways that you don't want to give and, I think it really, it's easy and more comfortable sometimes for therapists to blame the client for their lack of success or a lack of progress in the therapy or um, feeling challenged by requests, uh, for example, and again, feeling hesitant to say no or to shape a request so that it fits within what's comfortable for us. So, yeah, I think the work, I find it a wonderful growth opportunity. It can be challenging And it's challenging in such a way that brings out the best in me because it does require that I really know myself and I check in with myself and I listen to those boundaries and limits. Uh, And then my job is to sort of um, non-judgmentally and compassionately communicate my limits but certainly it's, it's not therapeutic to assume that my client or indeed anyone in my life should know what my limits are before I say. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, um, I, I find the work really uh, a wonderful opportunity and 
a beautiful process. Yeah, in it, contrast. <laughs> yeah, it's, it just, I mean, it, it sounds like you really have to think a lot about yourself as a therapist and maybe that's something we can um, definitely talk about if we have time. But as you were talking around that idea that the misconception that people with BPD are manipulative, um, one of the things I hear often is, you know, some of the behaviour being attention-seeking um, and that probably falls under that manipulation that people um, experience. How, how would you yeah. kind of describe that, you know, like it's seeking maybe connection or reassurance, but it's it's kind of interpreted as being dramatic and attention-seeking and, um, you know, in a very, very negative way show-off way that people then almost do the opposite and pull care away. Absolutely. So there's that urge to to denigrate, to to punish, to get impatient, to get harsh and to judge. And therapists might feel that urge and I think it's important for us to recognise where does that transference, where does that urge come from? And often uh, a client with BPD or a person with BPD has come from an upbringing where their, their needs aren't met and there might be very punitive and harsh and critical responses to very genuine requests for help or support. And it, we can easily uh, take on that role of the punisher or the abuser or the aggressor and not think twice about, about those urges and about what dynamics are going on. And I think really a lot of the time people with BPD have not had their, their needs met in safe ways as they're growing up. And so they've not had the experience of just expressing, expressing unmet needs in ways that children do and then having that be responded to, yeah, in, an, in that attentive way. And so often, often the, I suppose, the straightforward way of getting needs met, which would be simply asking or expressing our needs, it's been punished. And the only way people can get needs met is to really demonstrate their distress uh, in, in very strong ways. And I think it's it's been an important avenue to try to get understanding and to try to work out how to get support. And, um, yeah, so it, I think um, the way in which people try to get their needs met has served an important function and uh, an important role for people or they wouldn't use it so mm. yeah it's really interesting it makes me think a lot about um just sort of systems and family therapy and how we sort of can play a role in that we can get triangled in and as therapists or clinicians whoever's working with people we can sometimes reinforce those behaviors like you said by being punitive or dismissive um, which might be triggering that feeling of being punished in those early life experiences. Right. And so if we, that's why that the work requires so much care to understand and own and hold our own reactions and urges and thoughts in the work, own that as our own, and yet be curious about it because those urges and responses are often very informative and uh, really are stepping into a part of a play that's been written and that repeats and repeats and repeats. Yes. And, yeah. So interesting. 
Um, we could talk forever about this, but I did want to also cover the DBT skills. Um, so you, for those who don't know anything about DBT, um, what can you share about it in its sort of bare bones? Like what is it and who can benefit from DBT? Dialectical behaviour therapy is a, it's a complex sort of comprehensive treatment and in it and it sort of grew out of cognitive behavior therapy which focuses on thoughts and beliefs and how those thoughts influence our emotions and therefore changing our thoughts and modifying our beliefs can be a way in which we can reduce emotional suffering so that's a cbt approach when it came to trying to implement CBT with chronically suicidal people, Marsha Linehan found that many of her clients really struggled with the approach, really found it um, invalidating because I guess it's based on the assumption that thoughts and beliefs are problematic and to someone with a lot of self-criticism or a low sense of self-worth, then it's easy to feel invalidated and, oh, okay, so now I'm not even thinking right and, oh, now that thought is not right and that that's not helpful. And, of course, you, you know, it can spiral into a black hole of, of yeah, criticism. So, so people can be dysregulated by that focus on change too much change and it invalidates it's, it sends that message okay the person is not okay as they are and so Marsha Linehan added in acceptance based strategies and interestingly dialectical behavior therapy was the first psychological therapy to bring in mindfulness so it, it's really groundbreaking in, in its approach. And so it added in Zen philosophy, mindfulness-based approaches, learning theory, it's, and then dialectical theory. And that's all about how two opposites, which is acceptance and change, how really these can coexist at the same time. And... With people with BPD or the people she was working with who were chronically suicidal, this was another important layer in, in the therapy because those with BPD are often very dysregulated and their behaviours, their thoughts, their emotions tend to fall into extremes and all or nothing kind of places, including relationships in that all or nothing way. So dialectical theory, the idea that it's neither one extreme or the other, it's not just the highs nor the lows, it's not just the love or the hate. Truth isn't in one of these positions. In fact, there's both highs and lows. There's love and hate all at the same time. So what we aim for in dialectical behaviour therapy is this, the synthesis is the middle ground, is the shades of grey kind of balance approach. <laughs> so that's um, one level of the theory, but... More simply, dialectical behaviour therapy is a skills-based approach and based on behavioural principles. And what I love about this is it's because of an assumption that even though some of us have not had an upbringing that's helped us to understand what our needs are, how to manage emotions, what to do sort of with distress, how to handle or how to create healthy relationships. Even if 
our caregivers haven't been able to sort of teach us these skills, they are skills that can be taught and can be learned. And so dialectical behaviour therapy is based on beliefs and assumptions that any deficits we have in managing emotion, including those that lead to mental health conditions, these can, we can learn and we can recover. 100% recovery is, yeah, is possible. So I love that. So DBT teaches skills on how to tolerate urges, and that those urges could be uh, urges to use substances, urges to self-harm, urges to yell, urges to avoid, all sorts of urges. How to tolerate high emotion, heightened emotion, a lot of distress. How to um, communicate needs and respect and respond to your own boundaries and those sorts of things, how to do relationships, how to do emotions, all that stuff. So, yeah. Is it one of those things that as you were learning it, you had these mini light bulb moments of, oh, well, I didn't even know that. Like I find every technique I learned, I always apply it to myself and think, wow, I wish everybody knew this. We could have learned this in school. I wish we had this earlier. That is <laughs> absolutely 100% my experience it continues to be my experience because there are so many layers in DBT and I think that's one of the most common things that people say when they do dialectical behaviour therapy, when they participate in the skills training is I wish I had have learnt this earlier, I wish I had have got this because it's really foundational skills that we all need and we're not specifically or explicitly taught and it's a relief to to discover more and more about yeah these skills I think I think the other thing that um, I really love about dialectical behavior therapy just to answer an earlier question that um, part of the question is that it was also designed deliberately to cater for complexity, which means that people who, um, it, it caters for people who have multiple diagnoses. And it's, so it's transdiagnostic in the idea that because it's behaviorally focused, it's not so, it, it targets um, the behaviours and the problems that are relevant for any individual. And the diagnostic label is not so essential for the skills training because it's, it doesn't necessarily matter. Uh, it's, it can be informative, but it doesn't necessarily matter whether somebody's low mood is because of bipolar disorder or BPD or depression or grief, the skills to manage low persistent mood are the same. So the mechanisms around what perpetuates emotion, what increases the intensity of emotion, what keeps us suffering and holding on to emotion those sorts of things, uh, our tendencies to avoid and want to suppress and numb our emotions, these are universal. So it's really normalising as well, I think. It, it really <laughs> is. And, and it segues nicely into the other um, part I wanted to ask you was anytime I recommend some DBT skills to people, um, they straight away think, oh, are you saying I have BPD? Um, and I refer a lot of um, people to do the online courses that you offer and, and have things that are adjunct to therapy as well. What else is DBT suitable for? So I know you just mentioned something like low mood, which can be part of grief, depression, bipolar, I mean, anything. 
Um, but you also talked about as a clinician, every time you do something, you learn things. So it's clearly got um, a wide range of skills that it can teach people. But what what can it be helpful for? Like who benefits from DBT? Right. So even just so DBT is complex. But if we just take the skills training in isolation, there is evidence to suggest. So there's treatment studies that have been done that show um, improvement in binge eating disorder, bulimia nervosa, ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, treatment resistant major depression, depressive disorder, including in older adults, PTSD, bipolar, <laughs> um, and then non-specific uh, things such as self-harming behaviours, emotional dysregulation, uh, self-management and relationship management skills, and even uh, people who are incarcerated, violent behaviours, diff- difficult to manage behaviours. So you can see it's there's a strong body of evidence that the skills can be used for, yeah, such a wide-ranging number of concerns. And if we think about that, that makes sense because, as I said before, many people who come to seek treatment with dialectical behaviour therapy have more than one disorder. And so... It's common that a person that I see might have borderline personality disorder or some traits of BPD plus ADHD plus bulimia plus a bit of an addiction or some substance use disorder. And that's, that's, it's common. It doesn't necessarily get helpful to add in more labels and more diagnoses. So I love the way that DBT just simply targets you know what's the most important problems that you're struggling with let's start there and let's work systematically in helping to apply these skills to your specific issues that you're facing on a day-to-day basis yeah that's beautiful I love that like what's the most important problem you're struggling with and let's start there so it's very much around sounds like uh, maybe not symptom management, it's the right thing, but what what's where, where's the pain point right now? Right, right. DBT has a specific treatment hierarchy, which is useful for clinicians doing the work because there are often a lot of different problems that a client is struggling with. And So we use the hierarchy to help us to prioritise treatment and where we focus first. And, of course, the top priority in dialectical behaviour therapy is life-threatening and self-harming behaviours so that we we need to keep our clients alive or we can't help them. (laughs) So, yeah, so we, we address that because obviously that, any any sort of suicidal ideation and um, and actions indicate. I mean, they typically represent really strong distress. Anyway, in, yeah, yeah. You talked a little bit around that DBT came off CBT, like almost everything else. Yeah. <laughs> Is there much evidence? Because I know CBT, you know, if people who are autistic, for example, find that really difficult. How does DBT fare um, for, for neurodiversity in particular? I know you mentioned ADHD, but autism, where that identifying the feeling might not be as easy and people can go from zero to 100 like that bit quite quickly not because of mental ill health, but because of autism? It's actually really useful a lot of the time because DBT, what DBT does that uh, is it's really specific and, and concrete in when you're encountering this experience, this is what you can do. So it's sort of step-by-step behavioural 
analysis of problems and behavior change. And it focuses on using what works. So there's no right or wrong approach to behavior change. And so if a client of mine was struggling to identify emotion, then we could still consider how do they sense emotion in their body? Can they tune into that? Or are they noticing their thoughts or, or can they become aware of urges to, to yell? And any particular way into awareness is just as valid in, and we would choose whatever worked. Yeah, that sounds really great. Yeah, I, well, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to contain my excitement. That's okay. We, we can have you back for part two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, so much I love. <laughs> so you run, um, do you still have a client load at the moment? Yes, I do. Um, I love my I love my individual work. So I have this beautiful balance of individual therapy sessions uh, with my clients, and now my online training work, which I started. Oh, I was trying to start before COVID, but then COVID really hit the accelerator. So. Yeah, that's offering dialectical behaviour therapy skills online as part of a program. Yeah, that, and I've had some of my um, clients do those um, programs and they've been amazing. So they've been very well received. Oh, thank you. You mentioned some of the complexity in the presentations. So as a clinician, what do you do for your self-care and, and to manage your burnout and compassion fatigue. So working day in, day out with a more complex presentation, and I'm sure like many of us here in Melbourne, the complexity got higher during the last two years and we were less resourced, maybe emotionally. What are your self-care tips? Like what do you do for you? That is a, such an important question what do I do for me? What have I done? Because I did experience feeling right on the edge of burnout during COVID. So I had all the red flags flying as far as reaching my limits. And that's rare for me because typically I... I don't find my work draining. I um, find it quite, you can see I get excited. <laughs> I find it really enjoyable. So, uh, but yes, the, the additional demand over COVID and I think uh, um, really tipped the balance, but I think what tipped the balance more so as well as the additional demand and having to say no and turn people away when they were desperate, which I found really hard, uh, was the, a thing that contributed to me reaching my limits was the reduction in my social life and my fun and the things that I need to offset, I guess, and keep balance, offset the stress. Exercise as well, the gym's closing down. That was really tough for me. And so that's something that I, I do, something that has, yeah, enormous benefits. And prioritising playfulness and fun in my life is really, yeah, I feel like I need just to offset the focus on serious and negative things that people are going through and um yeah but the I have also what I ended up doing was cutting back on my clinical load there as well and reducing reducing that for a while and 
giving myself a little bit more time and a little bit more breathing space. And, and I felt like I, yeah, I really needed that because I felt that I had less resources over that time. I, I feel that now I've got those back and uh, I'm just preparing to start a new module of skills training and take on a couple of people from my wait list. So it's, um, it's good to be feeling back again. Yeah. So, that, I mean, that's really great stuff. And it's some of the things that we've been hearing consistently from, um, from listeners and from guests is those, the importance of those social connections, the doing the things that you enjoy, you know, for you, you know, it's, it's fun and lightheartedness, um, movement, um, exercise, whatever that looks like. I think they're all really great, um, great things. Oh, and getting out to nature. I saw your hike. <laughs> oh, it depended. Cool. That was mixed. Some people were like, why would you do that on your time off? And others are like, that looked so cool. <laughs> Ah, oh, very inspiring. I love hiking. So yeah, I in um I did the Overland Track in 2020 when there was a break in lockdowns and Amazing. yeah, so good. But I think the I think the challenge in the self care, particularly cutting my caseload, is there is. A, um, well, I feel a really strong urge to keep offering, to keep giving, and I find it really hard to cut back and say no. And so it's self-care sounds easy and it really but it's a, I find it's it's a, a challenge and an opportunity again for growth and it really is about honoring and listening to those limits like your personal limits and yeah I think I, I get lots of practice at that <laughs> yeah that's awesome it's been such a great chat um, if people want to find out more about what you offer and on your online stuff, where can they where can they go? So they can look at my website, which is www.yvettevardi.com, and they can follow me on Facebook. And that's a really good way as well to stay up to date with when I'm launching a new DBT skills training module for my online skills training program. And I actually, I probably need to update my website now, but anyway, and um, I am on LinkedIn, although not too much. I don't spend too much time there. I've got a dialectical behavior therapy uh, skills um, Facebook group for anyone who knows of DBT and wants a, a safe space to to practice skills and yeah that's it there's also I think there's an opportunity to sign up for just being on my mailing list on my website just to know what training I'm running and when I try to offer free things and be as generous as I can with my training and time when I can um, just because I really love the work and I'm pretty passionate about sharing it. Wonderful. People. Thanks so much. And I'll put a link to that website in the show notes for, for listeners. Thank you. Awesome chatting to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it's been fun. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast episode. The Inside Social Work podcast would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we record this podcast today and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you for listening. If you would like to support the podcast, you could leave a rating or a review on iTunes or wherever it is you get your podcast and feel free to join the Facebook group. It'd be great to hear from you. Have a lovely day. Bye.